my name is Tom Cross. Uh, I've been here 29 years. My wife Barbara and I have been here 29 years. The first eight years were uh, part-time. And we, we just did it on a lark, to be honest with you. We just wanted a second home on a lake. Didn't give a second thought to it would be our future house forever. But after living here eight years part-time, we just fell in love with Lake Wildwood, fell in love with Nevada County, and, uh, and never had a minute of buyer's remorse. Not a minute. Um, I served as a volunteer uh, throughout the last 21 years after I retired. I was on the finance committee for three years. Uh, I was on the planning committee twice. The first time we got fired. The board fired the planning committee. Didn't, we found out about it in the newspaper. <laughs> they, they were not happy with our chair. He was pushing them too hard, and next thing I know, they fired the whole committee. <laughs> so two of us went on the uh, finance committee, and, and that was really an eye-opener for me. I was on the golf committee. I headed up an ad hoc committee on a very gnarly subject, uh, which I won't get into here. And then I went on the board. So I basically tried to prepare myself to be on the board. And because I tend to be a student of whatever I do. If I'm going to do it, I, I truly want to understand it. I want to do it well. Otherwise, I'd rather just do something else. And so I, I, I prepared and prepared and prepared and finally ran for the board and got on the board. And for three years, and I thought I was well prepared. Three years later, when I finally turned off, I was still learning something. Because basically, this is a city. We actually have the population as twice what Nevada City has. Nevada City proper. So it's a city. There are very few of us have been trained to be city managers. You know, we all have our own specialties and our walks of life. So you literally are learning and learning. So if you like complexity and you like to learn and you like to make a contribution, then being on the board is great. I've been on many, many boards in Nevada County. I've chaired many of those boards. This was the best experience I ever had. In spite of all of those other, I was on the hospital board, music and mountains board, you name it. And this was the best experience. And the reason it was because you can actually get something done. A lot of nonprofits just spin around and spin around. You can literally get something done here, but you have to be good at, at what you do, you know, because you have to convince three other people to vote with you, which is not trivial. <laughs> so anyway, um, and so I do appreciate you coming, and as Fred pointed out, there is an ulterior motive to all of this. One, we want everybody to get to know more about Lake Wildwood. You know, you own the place. Oh, I gave you an answer already to a question I'm going to ask. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, in the end, we need volunteer leaders. But we need leaders who want to get better prepared. We've had a tendency in the past to have some people run for the board who practically walked in the gate the day before, and all of a sudden they think they can run for the board and things go sideways. We have a board member back here, Chris, who's in the green shirt. I just woke him up. Sorry about that, Chris. But I first met Chris when I was on the board because he chaired the Environmental Management Committee very successfully for many years. And so, you know, for me, I was extremely pleased that he decided to go from that committee into the run for the board. Living in any homeowners association, it has very special benefits, but it also has uh, some risks. And most of you don't want to hear about the risks, but I'll probably hint at them as I go. <laughs> Way back when we, were, we, we did, when I was on the planning committee, we did multiple, multiple, multiple plans to replace the clubhouse. And every time we came up with a plan, the board blinked and we never really called for a vote. Because they kept saying, well, nobody can afford it, nobody wants it, blah, blah, blah. Well, finally, when I was on the board, we called the question. And even to my surprise, when we asked for a vote, 70% said yes. So the place had turned over, and we didn't realize it. Every year, we, pour, we pick two, two, and three. So we, this coming year, we pick three, which is a huge turnover in the board. It's just the dynamics get all kind of weird for a while. So it's, it's, uh, we will vote, the, the, the ballot will come out, I think, I think late May, and then we'll vote and, uh, the, literally right up to the day before the annual meeting, which is late July, and then they actually count it that day, the Friday before the annual meeting, and then they announce it at the annual meeting. And like I said, there'll be three this year, and then there'll be two the following year, and two the following year, right? Okay, so you have the first page. The reason I start, I'm starting off with what I call a general framework of homeowners associations, because it gives you kind of a predicate to think about Lake Wildwood. So I wanted you to kind of have a sense of what is a homeowners association, period. And then we can drill down and talk specifically about our homeowners association. And then when we get to talking about our homeowners association, I'm going to give you a little bit of history, uh, and uh, much of which I got from Bi Maynard, who's been here since the early 70s. 
and he's been very helpful to me. And now I'm going to talk about the environment, but I'm going to do basically use the fact sheet that I handed out as that visual. And then I'm going to go into do governing documents, and I'm going to do it in a way that you shouldn't glaze over, because I'm not going to drag you through 47 pages of the declaration. I'm going to show you some highlights to get a sense of what the governing documents are all about. So homeowners associations are private. And the reason Boise, apparently, I don't know this for, for sure, Boise and, and Cascade came together at some point in time. And in the 80s, in the 60s, they decided they were going to get into building homeowners associations, Boise Cascade. And the reason they do that is then they want to, you know, they want to market it, they want to manage it, and they want to sell homes and lots, but then they want to move on. They don't want to run the place. And so that's what they did here starting in the, in the, in the 60s. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you more about that. But anyway, that's what homeowners associations do. And they, and they became very popular in the 60s. It, specifically, it says 1964, but I don't know what triggered that, unless it was a tax law change or something. But basically, they became popular in the 60s. And when they form them, they create these common areas, which is, uh, you'll see me harp on that all the way through this. Uh, common areas, you know, could be green belts. We see those at different parts of Lake Wildwood. Uh, storm water control you don't pay much attention to until the last, say, five years when we're starting to pour a ton of money into conduits and now we're a ton of money into Unit 4 where we had flooding taking place. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, for some of us, uh, we're much more enlightened about the water implications in Lake Wildwood. Fundamentally, everything flows to the lake, one way or the other. Um, and, then, uh, and then they have an array of amenities because, once again, they're trying to attract you up here. Uh, to, to uh, our association. And we have, you know, you know golf and tennis and on and on. These common areas have to be, be paid for by us. We have to pay the staff, of course, and insurance and all that other stuff, but we pay for the common areas. And we pay for it uh, through operating funds, uh, reserves, and I didn't put it down, but I should have put down capital improvements. So there's three major parts of the budget. And they will begin the budget cycle um, we used to start in September. That's when they finish it. They'll start the budget cycle probably in the, in the fall, for sure. And then they'll go through, as Fred pointed out to me, a number of meetings leading up to a vote uh, by the board, I think in March. But you'll see all the numbers before that as a home, as an, as a, as a owner. So you'll probably see the whole array of numbers uh, probably in, I'm, I'm assuming, sometime in February. And then eventually, then, then we'll have a new budget starting May 31st. So what happens is in a homeowners association, the, owner, the developer at some point in time will cross over. They will have gotten the money they wanted from selling lots and from selling homes. And at some point in time, they'll transfer the ownership to the owners. And I asked by Maynard this morning when, and he wasn't sure, but it's somewhere, if I, had to guess, I had guessed anyway, somewhere in the 80s. Boise Cascade said, we've made the money we need to make, we're out of here, and now it's yours, okay? And they transferred at no cost to us. So all these assets, we got, okay? Um, and when you become an owner, when you, when you actually buy a lot, buy a home, you're a member. It actually says that in the declaration, you are a member. You're not just somebody down the street. You are a member of a homeowners association, and you must comply with the documents. Whether you like them or not, you must comply, okay? And, and part of our staff is really there just to enforce compliance. And, and so, anyway, so homeowners are incorporated and they're subject, to federal and state, they're subject to federal and state statutes that govern nonprofits. We happen to be a 501c4. The nonprofits that a lot of you are familiar with in the nonprofit, in the, in the, when I think of the health and health and health and human care services like United Way, for example, or they're 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 501c3s. We're a 501c4 uh, for whatever reason, and uh, we don't pay we don't pay any federal or state taxes other than uh, we don't pay uh, we don't pay well we just don't pay any taxes other than the payroll, and we also pay incidental revenue. So we have some little gig on the side, whatever that might be. Then we pay taxes on that, but fundamentally we don't pay taxes. We don't pay property taxes to the to the county. We don't pay income taxes to the state or the feds. And so, in that sense, it's a good deal. Uh, now, interesting enough, there are 26 million units homeowners association units uh, in America. California alone has 45,000. So California has a huge number of associations. 
not necessarily big, as big as us. I mean, there's a whole lot of condos and a whole lot of, you know, small units out there. We just have to be quite large. And I, I don't know if we're the largest in California, but we're large. On the other hand, you go to Florida and they got one that's got 100,000 people, which is slightly larger. Yeah. <laughs> so the next page is an interesting page. It says that the, the benefits to homeowners may include maintenance and management services, provision of recreational amenities, enforcement of community appearance standards, etc. So that's the good side. I mean, when you buy in, hopefully that's what you buy in for. The disadvantages to homeowners may include the financial burden of association fees, punitive fines, restrictions on property use, and potential for mismanagement by the board. Okay? All the more reason to make sure you have qualified board members because they represent you and they have all the votes. The only, only vote you have after you put them in place is to remove them. You got no other vote. You can, you can grumble all you want, you have no other vote. So that's a really important decision you make. Now here's an interesting thing. Obviously somebody challenged this in court. It says in 1994, the California Supreme Court noted, and I quote this, owners associations can be a powerful force for good or ill in their members' lives. Therefore, anyone who buys a unit in a common interest development with knowledge of its owner's association discretionary power accepts the risk that the power may be used in a way that benefits the commonality but harms the individual. So that's just the way it is. I mean, you may grumble about, geez, I don't like not being able to put a fence up and I don't like not being able to paint my, you know, paint my uh, front door the color I want, but that's the nature of living in this place. And a lot of people don't realize that, and I'm not even saying I did when I bought in. You know, I didn't give a whole lot of thought one way or the other. I just, I like the idea of a controlled environment, but I hadn't thought about the implications of all that. Okay, so now the history of Lake Wildwood. Uh, originally planned by Boise Cascade in 1968 with articles of incorporation filed in the office of the Secretary of State. They had their first board meeting in San Francisco in 1969 and they built five houses. Well, on their board were just three people, not seven like we have today, and of course they were all their people. So that's just the way it was. And then in 1971, they actually built a, a lot on the, on, the, on the lake for a member. Other than before that, they were just building basically spec homes. Boise, much to my surprise, put in $30 million. I mean, that's a huge thing, but you gotta remember they cut this for nothing. I mean, lake, the lake itself was a stream. It wasn't a lake. In fact, there was a house out there in the middle somewhere. So, so they put up a ton of money, and it was actually conceived as a summer in a weekend retreat only. And, the, and that first hit me when I first retired up here and I went to work on the planning committee. Uh, we had a so-called facilities plan, which was required. And I said, well, why don't we have a master plan? Somehow that just sounds more robust than a facilities plan. So I started climbing into all the documents, and what surprised me was that, for example, because it was designed to be a summer place, we actually drained the water into the golf course. Because in the wintertime, they didn't think it would be up here, right? So then after, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, late 80s, 90s, I would say, we spent a huge amount of money getting the water off the golf course. <laughs> huge amount of money. Because we couldn't play uh, number 10 very often, we couldn't play a number eight, and, and, and number, number two got bad. So we literally spent a huge amount of money getting the water back off this drainage bowl that Boise had created. Now over the decades, obviously we've, we've, uh, we now have 2,845 lots, uh, and there's and the homeowners from all walks of life. You know, you're, you, I don't know your backgrounds, but we're all from different walks of life. We all had different professions, we either work for corporations or we work for ourselves, we might have been teachers. We did about everything. And so that's who we are today, both retired and, non, and, and, and still working. When I was on the board, and I've lost track of the number, but when I was on the board, uh, we, had, we, we had 800 kids in here. Now you see the school buses going around, but I had never really paid attention to the total number of, of kids that we have. So it's a, it's a, it's a vibrant community. We're not just we're not like Sun City, Roseville, where you gotta be 55 and over uh, to live there. The very first year I was on the board, which was 2011, about, I just joined the board, you, you, literally your first board meeting is in August. And in October, either September, October, the GM comes to the board and says, oh, by the way, there's a state law that's going into effect January 1st, and if you wanna cap the number of rentals, you have to decide before December 31st. 
So we literally just turned the place upside down trying to get this resolved with the members and in the end they voted it down. So there's no cap. Right? But if I saw the numbers that I don't have, it might show that it's been at least flat. I don't know that. You know, it, It's changed dramatically since I've been here. It's changed dramatically with more younger people. Because more people can work out of their homes now. And, and that's why the vote, when we had a vote on the clubhouse, uh, we, didn't have prior, we had previous votes on other issues and we never could get anybody to agree on anything. And when we got 70% to agree to do the clubhouse, I thought, whoa, the demographic has changed. And in the old days, I could go over the clubhouse, like, I could go to play golf and go in the, in the bar and I knew everybody. In fact, it was so quaint that people only had their own bottles up there, you know, that they, yeah. But I mean, I go over there now and I hardly know anybody. I know Fred, but that's about it, you know. <laughs> When I was on the board, there was always people grumbling and bitching about something. You know, we, I don't play golf, therefore I don't want to play, pay for golf. Or I don't play tennis and I don't want to pay for tennis. And I never go to the clubhouse. And, well, you, you, don't, you, don't, you can't pick and choose, you know. And I, and I wrote articles trying to say, when you drive through the gate, you bought all of this. You didn't just balkanize the place. And, and uh, so, so when you bought in, you bought into everything, but you have to comply with the governing documents. That's not an option. You may not like it, but it's not an option. And we have, when people say, you know, well, like we have security. And security, you say, well, geez, I feel great about security. Security is not the sheriff. They're our security. Secu the sheriff is the one that's going to save us, right? Our security is there to assure compliance, our compliance with our rules. That's what they're there for. Same thing with environmental management. They're really there to assure compliance with our rules. It has nothing to do with the county, has nothing to do with anybody else. So, so anyway, you bought into all of that, but you get the benefits of it. I mean, this place is beautiful, it's secure, we feel secure anyway. It's, it's, it's amenity rich, there's no question about that. I mean, you can do about as much as you have the energy to do. So, when, as my point is, when you drive through the gates, you get it all. Now take a look at the sheet that I gave you, and it's the first time I've ever seen this put together. And I assume they'll be using it in the office for with other groups. So I'm not going to go over each and every one of these things, but let me just go over a few things. The very first thing is 2,845. That's how many lots we have in here that people own. It was 2,841 when I was on the board because we subsequently sold the four lots by the gate over here in order to have some money for the clubhouse. And, and so now we're 2,845. So all the expenses get divided by 2845 now. Everything gets divided by 2845. So if you ever look at your budget, if you look at the, the approved budget off to the right, you'll see that everything was divided by 2845 to just normalize it, okay? Um, then you'll also see that, oh, also we have, st still have 10 lots. So we still have the capacity to sell some assets to put money towards something else. And if I was still in charge, uh, frankly, I would be looking at certain lots to sell to put more money into the reserves and, and get the reserves back to where they should be. That's what I would do. Not all 10, but I'm just saying that's what I would do. I would use those assets very strategically. If you go to the 10 scores, two lots, those are ours. When you go over to the clubhouse, we have this huge parking lot. Well, in fact, two of those lots are ours that are on Lake Wildwood Drive. And there's six others wherever. Don't know myself. And, and, but I'm just saying we, we have assets. Lake of the Pines apparently has no assets. So anything they do, they got to just gin up money to get done. In our case, we actually have assets still to be utilized in a you know, very strategic, strategic way. Anybody ever been to Sun City Roseville? Lincoln, excuse me, Sun City Lincoln? Well, you go in there and everything's pristine, right? I mean, it's like every house looks as good. Everybody looks the same, in fact, as best I can tell. <laughs> But they got 6,000 homes in there, and, and their association dues are really low, really low. And you say, how is that possible? Well, they don't have 32 miles of road. It's, it's county or city. Uh, they don't have a private lake. Uh, they don't have a golf course. Uh, they don't have, well, so they don't have some things that are really expensive for us. Uh, and that's just the way it is. When you bought in, you bought into the golf course. You may say, I don't play golf, but you bought it, okay? And the golf course costs us, if you take every dollar we spend on the golf course, I could guess it's about a million three a year. 
the operating cost is about say nine or whatever the number is. We try to cover that with revenue, so that's good, but we still have capital investments. We still have to buy new lawnmowers. We still have to, uh, 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 we still have to pay, well, we have to, new, new capital equipment like lawnmowers. Eventually the irrigation system has to be replaced. So roughly that golf course costs about a million three and we bring in roughly a million in revenues. So that's where it's at. Uh, the road system, 32 miles of road, costs us probably 600,000 plus or minus a year. Okay, uh, but we have good road system, thank goodness. Um, the, 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 the clubhouse obviously is still trying to get stabilized uh, cost-wise. At some point in time it will. And when it does, there'll still be a certain subsidy required, but it won't be anything like what we have today. But the fact is that's, that's subsidized, the clubhouse. Uh, basically, everything, all the common property is subsidized by definition. Um, when, I, when I first moved here, oh, we have security also, right? And security costs us probably 900000 a year, roughly. And, you know, in the old days we had guns and we took some comfort in the guns. Thank God they didn't shoot us. Uh, <laughs> but we, we have security, but the security, once again, is to enforce our rules. Keep people from speeding and going out when somebody's bark, or their dogs are barking. I mean, it's, it's not, if you, got, if you got a problem, call 911 so the sheriff can get here. You know, hopefully. Yeah, the survey we took some while, some time back, people valued security uh, more than anything else. Okay, now, I think some people are a little confused about how secure we are, but the sheer fact that somebody's got to make an effort to go through the gate somehow keeps some bad elements out of here. And I, like I said, I've been here 20, well, 29 years, and, and I actually looked at the security reports over the years. And, and, the, and, the, and the incidences would go up and then down and then up and then down and then up and then down. Well, what happened is it was the same family and their kids would do something illegal and they'd go to jail. So then it went down. <laughs> then they'd get out of jail and they'd go back up again. It's the same damn family. I mean, I just tracked them. Well, fortunately, they moved out here a few years ago. Thank God, hallelujah. The fencing, the fencing was, a, was a, interesting too. I mean. You don't realize what a nosebleed it is to try to keep making improvements in the place because everybody says, well, I can't afford it, I can't afford it, which is true for a lot of people, some people. Well, the boards back before my time decided they were going to fence Lake Wildwood and they literally put in a certain section of fencing every year until it was done, to the, at least to their satisfaction. And I was impressed by the fact that they actually made that decision and stuck with it because there's different boards. Every year you, have, you literally have a different board, if you think about it. I mean. This next year, we'll have four of the same board members, Chris, me, and one of them, and three new ones. All the dynamics start all over again. You know? So it's not a cohesive, high-performing group right off the bat because they don't, half the time they don't know each other. So. And then uh, just one sidebar. When I moved here, uh, bought on the lake, the, at the time, the cable TV purveyor was some local Yoko, and they actually ran the cable down the wa underneath the water along the lake. Of course, it's been dug up constantly when we dredged all this other nonsense. Thank, fortunately, Comcast came in and we got into a sweetheart arrangement with Comcast and they started dropping fiber into every home. So now we have high-speed internet, we got good TV, I and mean, it's all pricey, but we're, we're pretty modern technologically, which is nice. We came within, what, 40 votes, I think, of natural gas. It was slightly short-sighted by the members. Um, so yeah, we almost had natural gas in there, which would have been great because then we could have blown the place up like they did in San Francisco, you know. <laughs> the, the, the lower one on the right talks about the sewer. They upgraded that system dramatically three, four, five years ago, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So the capacity is a lot more, so therefore they brought all the sewage, all the waste from downtown Penn Valley over to here. That's where they dug up that road for a million and some bucks, whatever it was, four, four million, whatever it was. And it still has more capacity. So, I mean, we're fortunate there too. We got a pretty state-of-the-art uh, waste management. This is a map that in the old days you used to get. Anyway, so I, I use this often. Just the other day, I, the reason I was using it is I was trying to figure out, at this late date, where Wildwood Creek comes from, because it's the creek that's, that we use for, to irrigate the golf course. And it's the source of the flooding that we had. And I just, frankly, never paid attention to it before. So I looked into that. And of course, it, dro it drops into the lake. Everything drops in the lake. We are a private, privately owned homeowners association and country club. <laughs> I, w I was on the lake committee briefly. Way back, we had a lot of issues with our lake. 
and we just couldn't get the GM at the time to focus on them. And finally, the owner said enough is enough, and they forced the board and the staff to create a late committee, which has been chaired by Terry Tease ever since. And he subsequently became board chair, so he wasn't chairing at the same time. And, and so I thought, well, I'll join the late committee. So I go to the late committee, and I, and I sit there, and they say, OK, we're going to go around the room and talk about your background. So we go around, and this guy is just a water specialist, and he's another water specialist, and he's a biologist, and blah, 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 blah. And they finally get to me. I said, the only thing I know about the lake is the temperature goes up two degrees when my, when my grandchildren visit. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't last long on the lake committee. <laughs> but I did look up the map at the time, and, and, and Deer Creek literally starts from nothing. I looked at the watershed map out of NID, in fact. It starts up there almost by 20 and 80 from nothing, from nothing. And, and, and just basically just through rain and stuff builds up and builds up and then flows through here on its way to wherever. Wildwood Creek I never paid attention to. By Maynard though, interesting enough, once again by Maynard, um, he's the guy that lives on the point, one of these nice big lots over here. He actually has a, he has a hole in the weir that he buys water from. There's about 20 people in Lake Wildwood that buy the water from NID to irrigate their properties. And how you ever keep track of it, I don't know. And they do it by a little weir, by, on the weir, which is just a big board. And it's got a certain size hole that allows a certain amount of water through, and that's what he pays for. We buy 100 miners inches from Wildwood Creek for the irrigation system on the golf course, and we buy another 100 miners inches for, for Deer Creek. Yeah. Yeah, and that's been there forever. I, it's a sweetheart deal. I, I, I wouldn't even want to know what we, have, what we should be paying. We finally have a good website. Uh, I, in fact, I'm thrilled about the web. Most of us as board presidents wanted a better website, and we never got it. Well, we finally have a good website. And it's lwwa.org. And if you haven't been into it, you really should navigate through it. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then Bob back here is nice enough to show us what what we all got in the old days for CCNRs, now you get a, I think you get a disc now, a CD, and it's also on the website for everybody. So I, I just don't go into that binder anymore. So we have an Articles of Incorporation, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, that we incorporated, uh, Boise incor incor incorporated back in 1968. We have the Declarations of Restrictions, which they had restated uh, some, not too many years ago. Uh, restated bylaws, and then we have policy rules and procedures. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a taste of each of those categories. There's some key language in here that even as a board member, I, I resonated to. Uh, but once again, that's my whole approach to things. I just I become a student of whatever I'm, whatever I'm gonna do. So in the article of the corporation, it says that the established Lake Wildwood Association is a nonprofit corporation, which I already mentioned, we're a 501c4. And they gave us uh, purposes in, that, in the article of the declarations, two of which are promote the common interest and welfare of the owners. Okay, so that's what everything is about. We own Lake Wildwood, so the whole point of the board is to promote the common interest and the welfare of, of, of us. To also provide all kinds of services, facilities, and improvements deemed useful, beneficial, and helpful to said owners. To enforce restrictions. Remember I told you the security's job is to enforce the restrictions inside the gate. To care for and maintain all common property, and back to that same theme, common property, common property and to collect assessments to further said purposes. So that's a critical thing. Uh, everything, that, the board, if I were to ask Chris, you know, what's your number one responsibility? I know his answer. He would say, fiduciary. I have a fiduciary responsibility. Well, when I was trying to help Chris get ready to go on the board, I said, there's a second thing, and that is, you are the caretaker of the common property. That's the board's responsibility, is to watch out for the common property for us. And now the declaration, remember, I, that was, I just read from the Articles of Incorporation. That's, that's on the website. It's only a couple pages long. It's easy reading. Then you go down to, on the website to the next one, and that's the declaration. The declaration covers all limitations, restrictions, covenants, terms, and conditions for Lake Wildwood Association in eight articles. Also happens to be 47 pages long, so I'm not recommending reading it right now. So what they do in that declaration is they define the common areas and common facilities like the golf course, the lake, the clubhouse, the parks, the swimming pool. So when, when I was on the board and people would start, some people would start mumbling about, well, let's shut down the golf course. Well, the fact is, that's in the declarations. That would take a vote of the members to do something like that because we all bought in knowing there was a golf course. In fact, it was a draw for some number of people. 
Uh, it delineates property rights and obligations. For example, the acceptance of a, of a deed to any lot shall constitute the consent and agreement of all the provisions of this declaration. Back to my same theme. Whether you like it or not, you bought in on everything. If you don't like it, I have an answer. Join the board. Join the board. Or leave. <laughs> All right. And it says uh, members are entitled to one vote per lot. Okay? So, so even though we're married, some of us, we, we only have one vote in that lot. Now, interesting enough, my friend back here just said, half in joking, he says, well, why don't we charge the lakefront owners more assessment because they're on the lake? Well, thank God the declaration says, no, there's one vote, and we're all, it's all one class of membership. Okay, so we're all the same. Doesn't matter where we live, we're all one class of membership. Now it says, the board may enact and amend policy, rules, and procedures pertaining to the proper use and management of the properties, including common facilities, consistent with the association's governing documents. So, when I first went on the board, there was a rule in the golf that made no sense to me at all. And it was actually causing problems. And I couldn't figure out where did this thing come from and what does it mean? Well, it was a rule that some board had put in back in the 70s because in the early days of Lake Wildwood, some of the money people out of Grass Valley were coming here and buying lots so they could play golf. And, and, it got, and, the, and things got carried away and so they put this rule in to shut them off. But it was hurting the people who actually did live here. And so I went back in the decoration for the first time in my life, studied it, saw the discrepancy, and in a mere one year, was able to get one sentence changed. That's how fast things move around here. <laughs> <laughs> so there are times that the board you know, might get a little carried away or not know any better, and, and then put a rule in place that is inconsistent with the declaration. Now, hopefully it doesn't happen often. Um, and we do have a very, very good corporate lawyer, and in fact, one of the, probably the best in the field, and so we have ways to keep ourselves uh, in tune. Uh, it says, the environment objective is to ensure that structures, improvements, and individuals and collective membership activities shall be directed towards enhancement of the natural beauty and character of the properties and the quiet enjoyment thereof. So there's a whole section in the Declaration, it says Article 5, the whole thing is just on environment environmental rules. That's what Chris lived with when he chaired the Environmental Management Committee. Whole section just on what you can do in here, what you can't do in here. You know, whether you can or can't put a fence in, of what height, uh, how close can a structure be to, to the property lines or the common properties, ton, how, what color can you, can you paint your house and your door. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff. And it's a constant struggle because people want variances. They don't want to do sometimes what the rules require, and so they appeal to the committee and the board for a variance. And then, uh, so that happens, you know, every month there's something going on. And now to change the declaration, in the old days, it was 66%. Uh, but then it got changed somewhere, I think, in the 80s, maybe 90s, uh, to 50% uh, plus one. So if you want to change a declaration, how many, how many of you, well, I don't want to get into this. I won't mention dogs or motorcycles, but if you, wanted to, if, you, if you wanted to change a declaration, it takes 50% of the owners to actually vote, and half of those plus one to pass anything. And that's a very stern test. Think about it was originally 66%. I can't imagine you get 66% of people agreeing on anything. So it's a struggle to, to change a declaration. And that's a good thing and a bad thing, you know, because you can get a little flip and start trying to change the whole nature of Lake Wildwood. And the Declaration is kind of like our Constitution. It just kind of keeps us bounded, you know. And I mentioned earlier there's 47 pages. And, it, and I will tell you this, it reads really well. I mean, it's very impressive what they did. I'm sure it's cookie cutter from 10 other associations, but it's very, very well done and reads very clearly. In fact, <laughs> my brother in back here, Bob Martin, he, he, he's the guy that kind of keeps the process honest. He, he volunteered to keep it honest. Because the rules got really kind of, the changes were going on and they weren't being kept track of adequately. And, and uh, so he basically, on his own, jumped in to get those back in place and involved a few of us in, uh, selectively to help with that. 
And, and Bob, I think you were just telling me this morning that they're kind of now up to date, as best you know, that the, the website. So, so the website reflects what the board has already approved. And yeah. Yeah. And, and there was disconnects. And once again, it just depends on your, on your general manager. It depends on your staff. Now here's a classic case of a volunteer on his own initiating something and the board being wise enough to agree to it and the staff being willing to work with them. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's good finally. Uh, we also have the bylaws. So when you go on the website and you just kind of tick down, you'll see specifically bylaws. The bylaws define, control, and set the basic principles and manner by which the organization will be operated. Now in our bylaws, I didn't go into the details, but we have 10 articles and they discuss membership meetings, membership voting, makeup and duties of the board of directors, and blah, blah, blah. So it kind of, that's the operating framework that you work within. And, and it's interesting, there's, I mean, just stuff that you learn as you go. We have seven board members and a, and a treasurer. So if you go to a board meeting, you'll see the seven board members up there, and you'll also see the treasurer right there. Well, the treasurer is actually one of us selected by the board. It's not, it's not an elected position. You go to Lake of the Pines, and one of their seven board members is the treasurer. So just a little different construct, you know. So now we have policy, rules, and procedures. It says the board has the authority by majority vote to establish local policies, rules, and procedures through a well-defined process involving public hearings. So a majority would be four of the seven. Now, when I was on the board, uh, I sponsored a lot of changes to the rules, a whole lot of changes, because frankly, I wanted to institutionalize things for posterity's sake. I had to have three other votes, otherwise I couldn't get anything done. Didn't matter what I wanted, I needed three other votes to support me, and fortunately, uh, they were there. Um, there are policies, rules, and procedures governing all aspects of Lake Wildwood, ranging from hours of operation for amenities to fines for speeding to colors of structures. I mean, there is hundreds, if not thousands, of rules. And, and they're put in by each board, and, and sometimes the next board actually reads them, never sure, and, but they're there, okay? And I'll give you an example. When I first went on the board, I, Chris maybe was still chair of the committee, I can't remember, but we had these neighbors duking it out over Forest Park Circle, I think it was. And it had been going on for years, just years. They were really unhappy with the, the environment in this one person's house. And they finally, this one, these people put up 100 bucks and asked for a, uh, uh, a hearing. So I'm like two weeks into the board, and I don't have a clue. And, and so I'm sitting there thinking, now what do we do? I have no idea what the issues are. I don't know what the history is. And yet I have to make a decision at this hearing along with my fellow board members. Well, fortunately, we go into the rules and some other person like myself, probably a decade earlier, had felt the same way. So when they finished, they actually wrote down a 17-step process. It was awesome. We just literally just ticked off each step one at a time, went through the hearing, made a judgment, and was done. Well, it was an example of, though, that somebody took the time to write out the steps that they had done, struggled with, and it just saved us. It, because it the, the, the guys that conducted the hearing were, were, were me and my cohort, him leading the show, and we were, no, 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 it was way before, it was Gary Eckhart. And, and Gary chaired it, and I sat right next to him, we were both sweating bullets. We had no clue what we were doing, but we had the 17 steps. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the rules, big believer in the rules as, as a part of our history, okay? But once again, you have to have a board that, that will take the time to understand the rules and, and read the rules. And you have a tendency to go in selectively. Nobody in the world is just going to sit there and look at a, hundred pages of rules. So you get, an, you get an issue that comes before the board, a conscientious board member will climb back into the rules to kind of see what the precedent is. So anyway, I'm a big believer in the rules, to say the least. Uh, and, and there are inconsistencies. Like I said, the one I worked on, the only reason it took me a year was because I, we had a general manager at the time that wasn't terribly responsive. And, and it took me a while. I finally just called the question with our corporate lawyer, our association lawyer, and he, we got it done. But it was, it was, it was just, Took a while. So anyway, that's the rules. And if you've got any area that you're particularly enamored with, you should go into them. Uh, I find the environmental rules in particular of interest. I didn't, I mean, we got, we got a, lot of, a lot of homes in this place. There's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of blocks, right? You saw the map. This is just a ton of homes and a ton of blocks. I had never paid attention to the fact that we have carports. It just never dawned on me, you know? 
And so one of the things when Chris was chair and I was the liaison, the board liaison, I basically said to the committee, this is my last year on the board. What can I help? What rule changes would you like me to help you get through? And they raised their hand right away and said carports. I said, well, what is that all about? Well, there's some number of homes had carports. So they came up with a really brilliant solution. So what happened is that if they remodeled and added 900 square feet or some number like that, it triggered that they had to put a, 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 an enclosed garage. They couldn't have a carport. So it wasn't that we we're forcing anybody to do it. We just were triggering off what might be an event coming forward. So little by little by little, like I'll go back to looking at these pictures with By Maynard. I sat at his desk and he showed me pictures of Lake Wildwood back into the early 70s, early mid 70s, and very few houses. And the place was pretty shabby. You know, I mean, our parks were shabby today. They're beautiful. You know, the golf course was so-so. Now it's beautiful. Uh, the community, the, the clubhouse, you'd have to see it to believe it. Uh, I mean, this place has just dramatically changed in the last 40, 50 years, all for the better. And each year gets a little better, and it's not because any one person causes it to be better. It's a collective thing. Somebody will have something they think will make an improvement. They sponsor it. They advocate for it, and somehow it gets done. So it's pretty impressive what gets done here. The board is really, really important. I, I, you've heard me say this, I'll say it a dozen times more. Pick, getting qualified people to the board is just fundamental to, our, to us. If you think about it, the, our houses are probably one of our biggest investments, right? And would you trust your portfolio to a, a, a sophomore in college in finance? I don't think so. You know, I mean, you, you want people to manage your assets that are qualified to do so. And in here, our asset is Lake Wildwood, our house and the, and the common property. What's going to happen is we, we, the four of us that put this, or the five of us that put this together, we view this six weeks as like 101, course 101 like in college. Starting in February, we're going to do 201 for a small group of people who truly, truly want to dive deep and, and get involved in, in Lake Wildwood in a volunteer leadership role, preferably the board. And, and so that's part of it. We're hoping that a few of you will raise your hand and say, I'd like to go another step just to see where it leads me. So we'll see. Now, the board has a lot of constraints. Aside from the declaration and the bylaws, uh, it also has to uh, conduct itself in, in accordance with Davis Sterling. The Davis Sterling Act controls all homeowners associations in California, all 45,000. Okay, so when, when the board goes for a rule change, they have to comply with this, okay? Uh, when it, when it, uh, uh, his financial statements have to comply with this. There's a ton of stuff. If, if you don't like the way things are being done here, there's a whole procedure for you to complain to the board, and that procedure's in here. So this is really, really an important body of, of, of information. The reason I got into this is because my last year on the board, I decided I've had enough about the reserves being under-reserved. We're going to change the policies, the pre procedures, the whole bit. Well, I had to go into this, a deep dive into this thing to find out what the, the law was about reserves. So it's an important document. It, board members don't tend to get into it, but if you get into certain subjects, you'll find yourself taking a look at it. Not every state, apparently not every state has a law for homeless associations. Some, some are just the Wild West. Uh, but I think it's us, it's Colorado. There's a handful of states that do have a law, their own laws. Interesting enough, Davis Sterling, one of the things about Davis Sterling is very much like the Brown Act. So if you were, if you were involved in county government, for example, you'd be governed by the, the Brown Act. And basically, the, the board cannot, they can't collude with each other. So for example, Chris and I, Chris, Chris and two other board members can discuss anything they want, anytime they want, to see if they're all on the same page. They can't bring a fourth one in. And so that's, a, that's, that's part of the Brown, that's part of the Davis Sterling, which I think is, is, is hard, but I think it's important. Back in the 70s, uh, there'd be all kinds of real estate people being bussed up here with customers. And they'd pull in the main gate, the main, main gate, where's that at again? Oh, there. The main gate, and they'd take a right by what was the old fire station, not the current one. And literally one, one house down was a house that they all stayed in. And across the way was all asphalt, not the homes that we see today. And the bus would come in, turn around, everybody would get out, and they'd go into the sales office. And, and, uh, and, 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 the, and the campground, at that, back in the old days, had fire pits, had water, had all kinds of stuff, you know, all kinds of stuff uh, because the people who bought lots up here and can't, 
didn't build on them, had no place for their RVs because they couldn't leave them on the lots. So they'd buy a lot in order to play golf and use the lake, and they'd live over in the campground. So the you know, in years past, the campground was a pretty vital place. We had one general manager, but he liked cheap. He, 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 wanted to keep, he wanted to keep everything inexpensive. I was sitting next to him at a finance committee meeting when the assessment went over $1,000 for the first time, and he was practically in tears. Well, the way you keep that down is you don't maintain things like you should, and you don't reserve for things like you should. Well, I don't put the blame on him. There were 17 boards that also could have spoke up. And whatever reason, I don't know. I talked to one board president who said, well, he told us everything was fine. So we had a series of general managers that, let's say, weren't maybe guiding the board as well as they should have. Because reserves are complicated. The reason I got into them personally my third year on the board is I'd been board president my second year. And my third year, Mike Zemetra took over. And I went to Mike and I said, I want to be the lead director on reserves. Now, there is no such position. So I want to be the lead director on reserves. And that's where I focused that whole year, was on reserves. And that's where we changed the policies, the practices. We took all the common properties that were not in the reserves. We add them to the reserves. Of course, now we're under-reserved, right? Because right. now we put stuff there that should have been there all along. But you know, about, about four years from now, we'll be back on track. We'll be back to where we should have been.